So I'm going to try to give you some good content today and uh, something uh, unique and, and, and kind of new uh, too as far as disclosure. Um, just a path that I took that I uh, found that worked pretty well and uh, I hope you enjoy that. So uh, just moving on here, here's the obligatory speaker slide and uh, just I worked for Cisco Systems with a stat team there, internal product security testing, that's kind of where I cut my teeth in this industry and I uh, worked with some great people there. After that, it's tipping point, then work with some nonprofits and uh, independent security research. Now I work with the University of Florida in a health science center, which is a teaching hospital. And uh, we face a, a number of tremendous challenges there, uh, especially with uh, medical device security and patching and um, upgrades. It goes way beyond compliance uh, issues in, the, in, the, in that environment. So I founded the uh, MedSec group on LinkedIn. And uh, if you've interest in medical device security, I think that's going to be a very interesting area over the next few years. And uh, we'll see. Uh, we'll see when the lawyer. We'll see how many lawyers come out of the woodwork when, when that stuff starts happening. Um, just a brief overview. Uh, I did some past security research on VoIP phones back 2005, uh, 2006. And uh, if you saw HDM's talk, which is actually going on now in a skybox, so um, that's a consideration too. Um, just some basic VX works that he built on, which is great. Um, and just a quick rant. So it's really nice to see some ladies here. Um, big hand for the ladies. I tell you, I'm really tired of this industry being a sausage festival, okay? <laughs> we are missing so much by not engaging women and bringing women into this field. We're missing so much. Um, just really try to consider that and reach out to women who express an interest in security. I'm not just trying to get laid here either. I really mean this. <laughs> okay. So uh, we're going to talk today about uh, electronic door access controllers. And I refer to them as EDAC, just as a, a short acronym. Trends, landscape, some of the architecture, major vendors. And I'm going to go through a real world analysis, which has been going on for. Uh, um, you know, with the full disclosure process and everything up till about uh, uh, a couple months ago, and it started in uh, October of last year. So that device is the S2 security net box, and um, this is just one device in this in this industry, but I think it's representative of a lot of the technology that's out there. And uh, I really kind of beat up this company, and I, I pushed it to the edge uh, as far as them, um, you know, threatening to, to lawyer up on me, and uh, it, it got a little hairy at times. But, um, you know, basically I was like, hey, you know, I found these vulnerabilities are extremely stupid. Uh, if you're looking for something sexy, this is really the wrong talk. Um, there's some sexy pieces, but as far as the bugs, they're stupid. And that's great because I love talking about stupid bugs. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about, you know, some of the attacks and vulnerabilities and then get into countermeasures and recommendations too. So here are your learning outcomes. And, uh, you know, you're going to gain some awareness of what these systems are, who the players are. There's specific pen testing knowledge and additions to tools that are out there that I've uh, uh, submitted signatures and whatnot to. So uh, you'll be able to, to actually do pen testing um, on, these, on this particular device and be able to find it uh, after this talk. Some ideas about research and testing methods. Um, some of this has to do more with soft research as far as reading up and, and accessing specialized databases, more than just you know, regular web searching. And um, the twist to uh, DEF CON here is benefiting the EFF via ethical hacking. So here's some choice quotations. And I'll start with this one at the bottom first, which is uh, you know, one that's often been quoted in the security industry, and that comes from a gen Attorney General uh, uh, Janet Reno. Now the, uh, the context for this uh, was uh, um, GAO, Government Accountability Office, did penetration testing on their physical locations several offices back in 1999-2000 time frame. And uh, this is uh, an oft used quote in security about, you know, anytime I think you expose vulnerabilities, it's a good thing. So this top quotation is from the uh, S2 security uh, CEO and uh, it's when hackers put viruses on your home computer, it's a nuisance. When they unlock doors at your facility, it's a nightmare. Um, I would certainly agree with that. And that, that article goes back to way thousand, uh, 2004. And I pulled that uh, using specialized databases, so it's not the kind of thing that you'd find out on Google. What I'm getting at here is that when you're kind of butting heads with a company, 
um, it really helps to have this kind of information and that you can pull this kind of quotation that they stated and uh, say, well, this is what you said. And I've sprinkled that throughout this presentation so you'll see more of that as we go along. So just kind of a broad overview of the technology here of uh, electronic door access controllers, really looking at a trend towards using uh, IP. So a lot of this has used proprietary protocols and closed systems in the past. What they're trying to do is leverage all these other systems that are in place. So you've got your cameras, you've got DVRs, and they're also adding in other building functionality. So you've got elevators and uh, alarms and uh, uh, HVAC systems, temperature control. So it feels kind of hot up here right now. Hope, hope we don't have one here. <laughs> I think it's just the light. Um, another thing you'll see is uh, uh, some of these are integrating with LDAP systems. So where they want to go with this is that you know, somebody gets fired in an organization or they quit and they can just go to the LDAP directory, remove that entry and that will populate out and disconnect their email, disconnect all their access and disconnect their badge too by, by communicating with the system. This particular system doesn't use that, the S2, but there are others that do. There's a lot of vendors in this space and the vulns are starting to appear. So Cisco made a uh, acquisition last year, Richard Zeta, and uh, that's an embedded uh, controller system. And just uh, about a month and a half ago, they released a, uh, a number of vulnerabilities on that controller. Many other names you'll recognize up here, such as Bosch and Linnell and Honeywell and HID. Just for clarification here, I'm not talking about uh, attacking the uh, HID readers themselves. These are the back-end systems that have database functionality and uh, which are the, uh, the, the controllers um, for those controllers. So, so this is a little bit of a dig on facilities people but I actually have a, a, a big thanks to a facilities person who was coming into the company uh, or actually when I was working at this company, he came to me and he said, you know, we've got this company coming to push this new controller system for our doors and I don't like this interwebby stuff and uh, can you take a look at it? So that's really, really where this started. Uh, so big thanks to him. But here's what you see with these is, uh, you know, long deployments, they're managed by building facilities people and they're kind of stuck in a closet and just forgotten. And uh, you get pushback from uh, uh, physical security people too. So where I work, they don't even let me near these things. <laughs> so I've been working my way into that, but uh, it's, uh, uh, it's a tough crowd. And then patching, upgrades, maintenance, policies, all those kind of fall by the wayside with this because they're just out of sight, out of mind, even though they're used every day. One big thing is that you'll see third party uh, local service contractors, they'll do the management of the system. So nobody in house really has an idea of what this is. This guy kind of comes in once a couple months or once a quarter, does some stuff, adds some people, um, maybe you have somebody local who adds uh, the people and, and that's about it. So if anyone had really questions about the importance of this type of security, this Yale murder happened last uh, August in, uh, at Yale University in Connecticut. And this guy here, uh, his name is Raymond J. Clark. And that's the arrest affidavit, uh, uh, a screenshot of that. He killed that young woman below, uh, Annie Lee, in the lab. And uh, he was allowed to, by the police, to stay there and he was cleaning up and he was taking care of these animals in this animal lab and he was actually taking steps to cover his tracks. So he was scrubbing stuff. He, it was an awful story, but it's an, it's an amazing story, but it's awful. But, you know, he, he took this woman, he strangled her, and he stuffed her body into the wall uh, of, a, of a men's room uh, at Yale in this facility. So what I'm getting at here is that they really started to focus and, try and, and hone in on this guy as a suspect because of the building access control system, because they knew that people needed IDs. And then here, if you can see this, if you can go through this, it'll, uh, this is analysis conducted on Clark's electronic key usage and it shows all the different rooms and then they show the times that he and Miss, Miss Lee were together in the same room and then the last time she used her badge. So this is really how they honed in on this guy. Good afternoon. You guys were doing so well. I was so hoping not to have to come up here and do one of these. Somebody, or rather several somebodies, are stiffing Katie's. They're walking out on $100 plus bills. 
Let's apply social networking rules and make sure that doesn't keep happening, please. Because that's really kind of a dick thing to do. They're treating us really well, they're taking good care of us, and some of you are repaying them by walking out on, like I said, $100 plus bills. Please don't do that. If you did do that, please go back and pay your bill. Okay? Thank you. And it's not just once. This is like seven or eight people have done this. Okay, a little bit of a bummer. I got intimidated by him coming up on a stage. <laughs> so uh, I highly recommend that you go out there and get your bill. And I would say that there's video of all this too around here in case you all weren't thinking and you were just dumped up on booze and a hangover and at a hacker con. So this whole place is videotaped, every move. So they may just very well go back and track you guys. So go beg for forgiveness. Okay, moving on. So, like I said, I'm focusing on a particular vendor. I actually thought that they were coming up to tell me that um, lawyers got involved and I was pulled. Because <laughs> no. we all know how well that works out, right? You know, you're going you're gonna to triple my income potential and make me infamous. Perfect. I'm going to start looking at boats. <laughs> So one thing that's interesting in this, in this space, in this industry, is that there's a lot of rebranding of these boxes. So this box is sold under multiple brand names. It's built by S2 Security and marketed as a net box. Then it's distributed by Lanier and rebranded as the Emerge 50 and 5000 platforms. And then it's resold by Sonitrol, which a lot of people are familiar with Sonitrol. You may even have that at your house as a service and it's rebranded by them as a commercial uh, door access control, uh, physical control um, service. So they come in, they manage the box, they deploy it. This is the actual box itself and, and it's really not much to look at. I mean, you know, mostly you've got the card and uh, that's the uh, network controller piece and that's really what I focused on. So it's probably not um, you know, much different than uh, uh, this badge in, in, in some ways. Thank you, by the way, EFF for this. Um, and I'll get to that too. Uh, but the, uh, the application modules are what tie into the HID controllers. And again, you know, I focus on the network controller piece. This is the IP side that I'm attacking. Much smarter people than me, like, you know, Chris Pageant, for example, are, are working on the HID stuff. And that's just great. I mean, <laughs> mad props to them. I'm just humbled to be uh, in, in the same room. So here's an example of their uh, S2 security architecture. And you see how you have this head in box here and that's tied in with the IP video cameras and then here's a PC with a browser which might be a, a guard station that logs in with a limited account and so when somebody swipes in through, comes in, their picture pops up and a guard has a limited access can, and can view um, what's, uh, you know, what's happening at that station. And then you know you have the World Wide Web, web here, VPN or WAN and then might go to another site a facility too where you have another box and this box is actually a head in to you know perhaps oops perhaps that one or uh, even the uh, so they can act independently or they can network together so when doing research on this a lot of times you know it's real tempting to just jump into the packets right fire the tools let's get the signatures one thing i really want to stress is that it's important to go out and do your research and do your reading on the company so go through their security uh, documentation, their case studies, their press releases. Of course use the search engines, but really uh, if there's one thing that I can stress to you taking away from this presentation, and this will work across any research that you do, and that's it's well worth a trip to an, a college campus where anyone can sit down at a terminal and use very high-end subscription databases. LexisNexis, ABI Inform, hundreds of others. And uh, this is a, a, a hidden trove of information that you can uh, uh, get to and anyone can use it. You don't have to be a student, you can just stroll into a university and, and ask the librarian for help. So from one document I was able to determine, this is a, a case study published by uh, SQL um, and uh, S2 together. And from one, one document I was able to get so much information. You know, I found out, okay, they're using SQL, they're using Samba. Linux distribution is, is the same as that Zorus handheld from a few years back, right? <laughs> kind of cool. 
processor information. Now these last three items really caught my eye and this is the kind of stuff that should pique your interest right away. If they tell, if they document or write down or say that it only took them 15 months from design to customer shipping, <laughs> that's kind of scary. That's very fast and it's, it's commendable. But uh, you know, there's obviously a lot of questions that come into that. They say they don't have much experience with open source. Okay, definitely, you know, my ears prick up when I when I hear that. And then the key here is the MySQL is used to store everything, so the whole system is in that database. So that gives me a real target uh, to focus in on. Now, again, I, earlier I mentioned, you know, it's good to have some ammunition because. When they come back at you and uh, you know start making threats or uh, uh, push back, it's great to come up with these quotations. And when I can come back to them and say, "Well, look, you know, on your website here or in this document, you say that it's safe to deploy this system across any network, even the public internet. Okay, you say that remote locations are easily handled, and you say that this thing can operate for years, years without maintenance of any kind." <laughs> Okay, this crowd knows where that's going, but other crowds, you know, they're like, oh, okay. Yeah, that sounds great. <laughs> you see where this is going. So having this kind of, you know, having these kind of quotations in your back pocket to put out uh, to them when they push back is, is a great, you know, uh, have a big cup of, uh, you know, up. <laughs> so I'm going to dive into some of the components here of this netbox. And uh, what we've got here is a, uh, an HTTP server and then there are MySQL and then later versions have Postgres. So obviously as you know these, these uh, devices go through different builds and they add more features, uh, they're changing things up a bit but, but those are the two databases that they use. Then they have this uh, NMCOM custom application that they wrote and I, I'm going to talk about that a little longer, uh, a little later but that's a really interesting thing and uh, I think you'll like what I talk about there. And then of course you see like FTP and Telnet on security devices, right? So their HTTP server is the go-ahead web server and in my opinion it's a poor choice. So you're looking at 16 CVEs out there and I, there could be more. I just stopped searching after a while. It's was like, well, you know, what else? But uh, not to beat up on go-ahead too much but it doesn't seem like they've been very responsive uh, to these vulnerabilities. And so if you look at that CVE in 2002, uh, go-ahead was contacted on three different occasions in the last three months but they supplied no meaningful response. Now what's interesting about Go Ahead Web Server is that it's open source and it's free and you can download it from them for, for no cost no, and I don't even think you have to register. But the thing is, is if you're going to offer and serve up an uh, open source web package, do us the courtesy and try to maintain it. So here's one of those quotations on the bottom here and, and this is from John L. Moss, he's the S2 security uh, CEO. And this is data security is a challenge and unfortunately not everyone has risen to it. So, so when you look at the SQL server I was like, wow, this is kind of weird. Okay, typical, you know, it's listening on TCP, you know, 3306. It was outdated and I was like, 4.0, that really sounds kind of old. I was like, how old is it? End of life, I go to MySQL product archives, forget end of life, end of download. Okay, you cannot download this SQL 4.0 from the MySQL product archives. And that's down here. So, I mean, it's not even worth their bandwidth to host these, you know, even for posterity, even for just for archival purposes. So that's in a production server for a physical control unit for your facility. That's pretty troubling. The NMCOM is a uh, TCP service and what this thing does is, uh, the service does is it performs multicast discovery of the HID nodes on the network. And it's a custom daemon like I mentioned and then there's a patent. So this goes back to doing your research and looking at all those other information resources. So I go and I look for patents filed by this company and then by certain individuals in the company and I found this system and method to connect, configure network mode. So you, there's a tiny URL there and you can go read the patent but it reads like an RFC. And uh, this is, you know, the perfect type of uh, uh, application that, you know, you, you want to start fuzzing right away. And you can, you know, read through that and almost, you know, grep for mess, must not. <laughs> okay, in this patent, just like you would do in an RFC, uh, grep for must not and start focusing on, on that area for your, your targets. So FTP and Telnet, I mean clear text protocols for a security device, 
You know, you see this quotation on the bottom here. We see some vendors fitting their serial devices with telnet adapters, which simply sit on the network transmitting unsecured serial data. Yet in your own device here that you guys build, you have telnet to manage it. And by the way, that runs as root. And that's new. I haven't talked about that before. But there's diagnostic tools that are built into this system that you can access as an administrator. It will give you the a tarball of the uh, uh, diagnostic file that you would send to S2 for debugging and um, you know, help. Um, but if you go through that, you know, you start seeing directory listings, you start seeing, you know, the permission setting on daemons and all kinds of stuff. So that's bad. I mean, telling it's bad, but then running as root, you know, is, is, is really, really bad. And then the, the security documentation you see here is uh, they'll say, this is a screenshot. So network administrator tasks on the FTP server create a username, password, directory. Uh, a password is optional. You know, the, the backup directory must be created at the root level on the FTP server. <laughs> I mean, it, you know, it's like 1997 you know, stuff that you, that you see here. So what's really interesting about these, and I, I alluded to this at the beginning, is all these new features in this convergence. So that's the other thing to walk out of here. Think about, you know, when you think about security systems, don't think of them as closed. Think about this convergence. Think, you know, they're tied into the cameras. There's going to be communication information and configuration information that's in those cameras to make sure that they can talk back. If you get on a DVR in a network, what's that DVR talking to? Um, there's a lot of uh, 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 network devices that are going to be uh, talking to these and depending on the configuration and the licensing scheme, you'll come across this. So again, that's you know increasing the attack service, and you know you really got to wonder like how are they using voice over IP in a in a system like this, uh, the burglar APIs. So here's some features. You know you can pull this up and look at a building's floor plans. Um, that's very useful if you're gonna go in and try to steal a server uh, from them. Here's one of the vulnerabilities, and this was the uh, first one that I found. And this is a remote, unauthenticated factory reset, okay, via a crafted URL. <laughs> you know, when I was putting these slides together, I was like, what else can I write here? I, <laughs> I you know, it's like the box, you know, it's like, a, it puts the box in the condition that, you know, when it arrived on your doorstep. Okay, it wipes everything. There's some back and forth with S2 about, you know, what the actual impact is. They say that there's some configuration that's pushed out to the end nodes and um, to the HID readers and that there's not going to be, um, you know, a, a catastrophic impact like your cards aren't going to work on the doors. But uh, again, you know, I only had this for a limited time, about a week, hands on and uh, didn't really have the chance to do that. But hey, it's a factory reset. I mean, you know, there's not much you can say to that from no auth. Here's the, the, the other one that came out and um, this is the, uh, the access to the backup database. So this is an unauthored, unauthenticated attacker. You can download through via HTTP the database backups. Now it's a nightly DB that's hard coded, okay, in cron. So what that tells you is that you've got a file name here that's predictable, right? You've got, you know the time range that it's going to run and then you know the naming convention. So you can do almost blind um, uh, w gets for this across systems without knowing anything about it. And you're going to uh, just do those requests, which, like, is horrible logging on this thing. You really have no idea when you're getting attacked. Um, so, an attacker gets that backup d database, again, referring to that document that MySQL and S2 put out together. Everything's in the database, right? Everything. All your cards, all your names, all your credentials. Uh, floor plans, employee photographs, everything is in a database. So here it is. You extract the admin MySQL 64-bit hash, okay, and that affects both the 2x and 3x series with my, uh, MySQL and Postgres. And then you can, you know, crack that hash, which is trivial, and then there's the CVE for that. So once you have that, I mean, the attacker has admin access in the box. What can that attacker do? Well, how about opening some doors? Okay. Everybody likes that. You can open a door right now and there's that smoker's area down there, right? So, I mean, you go have a cigarette, you hang out, a little short chat chat and then you whip out your iPhone and go to the HTTP interface of this and then uh, click open the door and it's an automatic bu button and it opens up right for you. Or you can schedule it for ODark 100 and come back with your crew. 
So here are the uh, cameras, okay? So the cameras are in the database too, right? And uh, this, uh, this is actually a screenshot from their demo that was online and uh, the license actually just expired today. So uh, I can't go to it live but uh, um, this is uh, uh, from their demo box. So I'm not out there hitting live boxes. And uh, this affects the uh, 2X and 3X systems and now the attacker owns all the IP cameras. So what's great here is um, I'm not just picking on S2 because there's this perception across the industry. So this quotation on the bottom is from Justin Lott and that's from Bosch Security Marketing and Bosch is in this EDAC space as well. And he says most hackers don't care about watching your lobby. If they gain access to the network they're going to go after financial data and trade secrets. I, I don't know what you're talking about, okay? I think a lot of people who are trying to attack a building and go in there are going to be interested in looking at the video and looking at the webcams. I, I would certainly be. So here's the uh, DVRs and digital video recorders. Um, the user pass to those is in the backup. And uh, another thing is, is there's poor uh, recommendations here uh, by them. And uh, so here it is. They recommend keeping the default user and password uh, on this, right? I mean, it says, you know, right down here at the bottom, we recommend that you use these defaults. Um, and then there's some more HTTP directory grief that I, I found later on because I was like, oh, I didn't look, I didn't check for this, I didn't check for this. And node logs, which are the, uh, the uh, logs of the devices authenticating back in, the nodes and the, the card swipes and all that fun stuff. And then employee photographs, uh, being able to pull those directly. Now here's some remote fingerprinting that's come up and um, their Mac OID is registered to S2 security. So that makes it uh, you know, much easier to identify one of these devices just by its Mac address. And then as I noted before I contributed to some of the open source tools out there so there's an NMAP uh, service fingerprint uh, for this in NMAP 5.20. And then another thing is the, uh, uh, for every IP uh, for these devices they left in a blank .html page. So that's another way to look for these and uh, confirm that you actually have one and props to uh, uh, Skipfish on, on finding that. Shodan. <laughs> Shodan is um, a real game changer in, in my opinion. And uh, I have to give huge props to Shodan on this because I was getting a lot of pushback from S2 uh, about, you know, saying that they're difficult to find, that they're not on the internet and all that. And actually the two below that are direct quotations from them which is, you know, it's behind a firewall, accessible only by VPN, deep within the corporate network. Whatever that means, right? I mean the front line is everywhere. We, we know that. So they're, the targeted searches for this, you know, unique fingerprint. And uh, it's been going up. So back in March there was 150 of these devices on the network that you could identify. Now there's 341. And then here's the search that I did today. So 341 and then here's the string that I'm doing. So here's the go ahead web server, right? Looking for login ASP, the no cache and the must revalidate and then you see those strings showing up in the um, results down here. So I don't have internet access on this. I'm not going to click on any of these URLs but uh, I'm very, very confident that those are all net two boxes out there of some variant or another. So really getting to some of the recommendations here, <laughs> it's, it's just not right unless you have a lolcat. <laughs> You know, something, uh, something that you don't think is a threat, you know, you just bring it up and uh, it's like an individual, right? It's like, oh, it's just some guy out there who got a hold of your box for a week. You know, what could he do? What could he find? You know, what impact could he have? How could he change our business processes? You never know, okay? But you get your nose, you know, it's a whole nother story. So I've made recommendations here for them to, you know, conduct security evaluations on your products, you know, better your deployment guides, your third party integration, right? Those web cameras, those DVRs don't want to see that kind of bad stuff. And then the, uh, you know, improving their logging. Like I mentioned before, the logging is really bad on this. I mean, there's just nothing there. 
So you don't even know. I mean, you can tell when somebody else logged in as an admin or another user, and, and that's about the extent of it. Being able to offload those logs to a log server uh, to try to maintain some integrity would be really be good too. Use better HTTP daemon, HTTPS by default, and then I would always recommend to any vendor, you know, you want to keep yourself a moving target. So modify those, you know, banners, reduce that fingerprint. If you see your devices showing up in Shodan or other uh, uh, search engines like that, you know, modify it so that your customers uh, can get some more protection down the road. And of course, you know, FTP, Telnet, uh, moving those to secure protocols as well. Customers, customers got to push back. They got to demand better security. They got to go all the way down the, the chain here. So starting from the, the vendors and then going to third party resellers, all those local guys coming in, print this stuff out, hand it to them and say, you know, what are you guys doing about this? How are you insuring us? Got to manage this stuff just like any other system. You know, security reviews, the patching, the change management, you know, all that tedious stuff that is, uh, is so necessary. And then, of course, the technical side, you know, isolating these and, you know, using VLANs and Mac auth, VPNs, restricting IP, good stuff. So one of the outcomes of this, and this was actually sent to me, this was sent to me by a, uh, a competitor of S2. And they said, hey, did you see this letter that went out to the integrators? And I was like, oh, that's interesting. And it's uh, from John L. Moss, the CEO, to our system integrators, I have had a number of questions recently about how to secure network physical security systems and I'm writing to address this important subject. So the threat, this may sound like paranoia, but it's not. There are thousands of people you don't know all over the world who are actively trying to break into your you, typo security systems right now. Uh, in a physical security world, we are not used to dealing with invisible threats from malicious people who don't know where we are and thousands of miles away. We have them. So it's great to see this kind of uh, recognition um, from a, a, you know, a company and, and reaching out to their integrators. But this was forced recognition of the problem. You know, this became, this, this letter is a result of me going out there, me, you know, letting CERT um, know about these vulnerabilities, communicating with CERT. Huge props to CERT, CERT CC and US CERT, uh, because uh, uh, I couldn't have done it without them. And uh, those guys pushed, too. Um, they, 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 they pushed these guys and it was great to see. But a problem with that, not with CERT but with this letter, is that, you know, he goes down, he continues on, hackers, hackers bad. <laughs> and then, you know, here's protecting your system, right? Which is great. So put your systems behind a firewall, change your passwords, use strong passwords, VLANs, VPNs, maintain your software. So that's, that's, that's great to see. But then, up here, how we deal with vulnerabilities. And he says, um, S2 works with CERT, a nonprofit organization that responsibly handles vulnerability resolution. CERT, funded in part by you know, DHS, learns about vulnerabilities. Well, the thing is, is they reference CERT, US CERT here, but I coordinated mainly with CERT CC. And so somebody who's a security person and reads this says, you don't even know who the organizations are that you're talking to. Okay, about this. So that's the kind of thing that you know we we want to change. You know, we want to make sure that when a company puts out a statement like this, that they actually are referring to the to the right people, security people who have assisted us in driving these issues to resolution. You know, got to give them the respect and where it's due. So back at CarolinaCon, which is actually a great conference. Very intimate, highly recommend it, and those guys did a great job there. So this, they recorded me and it, it found its way onto the web. And what I had made there is an offer, an open offer to any vendor in this space. And here's the, here's the offer. You make a donation to a nonprofit like EFF and you get a tax deduction for that, for that donation, okay? In turn, I, in recognition of your donation, this isn't a quid pro quo, in recognition of your donation, which could be uh, an amount based on going back 10 years ago, the line was people spend more on their coffee budgets than they do on security. That's definitely not the case anymore, but with product security, it is in some, in some cases. So I say, okay, give your coffee budget to EFF in the donation or um, 
I'm also considering the uh, uh, political contributions done by the top executives. Okay, that's that's public information, and uh, it's also free speech. Okay, on on their side, if you're not following that at all, corporations you know, now have now can give political contributions, and it's free speech, and there may not even be any disclosure at that. So, kind of, kind of, kind of creative with come up with creative ways here of uh, you know setting a price point. I'll sign an NDA. Okay, and then I'll do an eval in a box. I'll do a report and an out brief, and I may pull in other engineers under uh, this type of testing and have them under NDA as well. So I've done this with a colleague at work, and uh, the John Sawyer, uh, who's uh, uh, right down there, and uh, throwing the support. And it's great because you know having two minds is always better than one, and uh, he uh, compliments a lot of my skills. Uh, uh, so, you know, I'm not coming in here with an ego on this stuff. It's like, you know, obviously there's going to be things I can miss. If I can bring in another smart uh, person, um, that's fantastic and uh, all the better. So, you know, we set this up. I'll do an eval box, report and an out brief. And then planning here is additional advice for product security response. So, you know, when talking with these vendors, uh, do a security page, have an email, uh, point of contact, your PGP, key up there, all the good things that we like to see, right? I mean, how many times on the mailing list are we seeing, does anybody have a security contact for X company? Um, you know, it's, uh, it's tedious and in this day and age, you know, we just don't have the time for that. Introductions to CERT CC, US CERT, and then uh, uh, suggesting uh, strategic security conference uh, support. You know, there's some good ways that companies can um, um, uh, enable security conferences uh, without seeing like a suck up or without throwing out the uh, uh, too much vendor crap. So here it is so far. So far I've got approached by, uh, I've been approached by two EDAC companies. And uh, the process has been talk, establish a trust, which is everything, right? I mean, you got to have that trust. And that's taken some, some hand holding and back and forth, but we, and there's some trepidation. One in particular was, hey, Sean, this isn't going to end up on some blog post, is it? You know, and that's, those are the kinds of fears and, and concerns that you need to assuage with, uh, with these people and say, no, you know, we got this under NDA. These are the objectives. I'm not looking to make money off of this. You know, I'm looking to better the security. It's good reputation building. It's good experience for me too, uh, of course. So the first company donated to EFF and they enabled uh, uh, me to win this uh, contest. There was plenty of other great people who supported me in this effort too. Props again to John Sawyer. He threw the flag out there and uh, got, got some folks to contribute. But together we raised $2,560 uh, uh, for EFF uh, just from this one evaluation and, and from the support of folks. Got the room, got the nifty badge met some really cool people uh, through this and uh, I think it's just kind of a unique way to uh, uh, enable some security testing. So I kind of went quickly through this and um, maybe a little faster than I wanted to. Too many Mountain Dews. But uh, I'm certainly open to any questions and um, don't feel obligated to come you know, up here now. I mean I'm going to be around so feel free to grab me. My contact information is here and that's it.